back to the Fourth Way Podcast. In this episode, I had the privilege of interviewing Randall Balmer. Dr. Balmer has been a part of evangelicalism his whole life and had experienced its political transformation from the inside. I wanted to talk with Dr. Balmer because his insights are going to be helpful for us in a number of different ways. I want to point out some of those ways now so that as you listen to the episode, you can hone in on the meat of our discussion. First, I want you to see the face of propaganda in our discussion. There are a number of times throughout the interview where we talk about the religious right being genuine, holding on to a true belief, advocating for an appropriately moral stance, etc. But as we've discussed throughout the season, propaganda as we know it today isn't about lies and deception, though it may often include that. It's really about eliciting a response, as Elul identified. That means that propaganda is often less about the truthfulness or falsity of an idea, and more about how such an idea is presented. A fact in and of itself may not be all that meaningful without context and presentation. Some of my favorite commercials, which I'll make sure to link in the, in the uh, show notes, highlights this. These, uh, these don't judge too quickly commercials take viewers through a scene where we get the whole context, but an actor within the scene only gets a snapshot, and hilarity ensues. Because while the actor and the viewer are seeing the same snapshot, only the viewer has the given context through which to interpret the snapshot. So, as you listen to this episode, after first watching those funny commercials, put to the side this notion that we're arguing about whether abortion is moral or not. We're not discussing that at all, really. And if you want to hear why I think abortion is a travesty, you can go ahead and listen to my season on abortion. But what we're really discussing here is not the moral truth surrounding abortion, but how the information is wielded and towards what end it has been wielded. Second, I want you to see the creative power of propaganda. Part of what we discuss in this episode is the transformation of evangelicalism. It's disheartening to know where we've come from in regard to social justice and where we are now. But that's due in part to the way that propaganda polarizes communities, isolates them, and transforms them. So listen out to how propaganda does that throughout this episode. Finally, as this episode is placed in the middle of our discussion on how propaganda works within the, the racism discussion, I want you to listen out for how propaganda has insulated the evangelical community from repentance in regard to racism and allowed us to foster racist ideas and policies by lumping all race issues under the umbrella of woke or liberal. This dismissive power of propaganda has perhaps been one of the strongest weapons in the arsenal of racists who are aware that they're racists, as well as those of us who don't see the racist that propaganda has created us to be. I hope this gives you a good guide on some of the major discussion points to look out for. So, here it is, the interview with Randall Balmer. Thank you so much for, I'm sure your schedule is really busy. So um, I appreciate you taking taking time to to talk to somebody that you've never even met before. I appreciate that. That's fine. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. So just a, a little bit of background about why I contacted you. Um, you know, 2016 was a, was a really big time for me. Um, I, I grew up in a Christian school, went to Christian college, uh, taught in a Christian school for a while. And, uh, you know, taught all this integrity stuff. And then 2016 comes around and my mind was just absolutely blown. You know, yeah. what happened to integrity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that that just sent me on a path, a good path. Um, so so in some ways, I'm, I'm sort of glad that happened uh, from from my walk with Christ. Um, but at the same time, it's it's very it was very disconcerting um, to me. And so that, that sent me down a path, you know, searching through a lot of things, but you know, the, this, this final thing that I'm kind of grappling with is truth and uh, propaganda. So I, I've been trying to figure out how do we know what's true? Like, how do we, <laughs> how do we know what's um, you know, how people are using us and manipulating us. And so uh, after reading your book, I was, um, 
I thought you'd be a great person to contact because I want to talk about how our group uh, has has propagandized and um, mm. to help us to discern through some of those things. So before we get into some of those questions about uh, our group's propaganda, I would love for you to kind of I don't want you to spend too much time on your qualifications in evangelicalism because I know you can find that elsewhere and I'll put links there. But if you could just give a, a brief overview of of how you're qualified to talk about uh, evangelicals from the inside, that would be great. Sure. I, I grew up in what I call the evangelical subculture. I didn't call it that at the time, but uh, <laughs> looking back on it, uh, this vast interlocking network of institutions and uh, mores and folkways that uh, constitute uh, evangelicalism uh, in America. So uh, I was born in Chicago while my father was a student at uh, Trinity Seminary, now known as Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And then uh, as his career uh, proceeded uh, over the course of 40 years while I was still uh, at home, we lived in various places as he uh, was pastor of various churches in the Evangelical Free Church of America. So I gave my heart to Jesus for the first time um, very early, very young, uh, first of uh, many times, and uh, attended uh, uh, vacation Bible school, Bible camp, uh, Sunday school, church many times, several times mm -hmm. a week, and then um, and then uh, really uh, kind of finished off my my formation by becoming a uh, an undergraduate at Trinity College in Deerfield, Illinois, and then a uh, seminary student uh, where I actually worked as well at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, then I headed off to graduate school for a doctorate and uh, on to a teaching career. But uh, I, I often say that I'll, I'll put my evangelical credentials up against anybody, including Franklin Graham, although I concede his father might have been a bit more uh, famous than mine. Perfect. And uh, I will make sure to put some links to some of your lengthier uh, discussions on, on your background. Um, but we, we could talk about a lot of ways that, um, you know, our community has propagandized us and, and uh, others. But I, I don't think that there's, there's a much more formative issue than, than the abortion issue and the way that that's been, been wielded. And that's something that you spend a lot of time talking about in your books. Um, so, so first of all, you know, I, I want to kind of zoom in on the the timing of abortion becoming a significant issue for evangelicals. Um, and, and I think the first time that I was exposed to that idea was reading Cruz and, and Fitzgerald on their works on evangelicals. And they quoted uh, Jerry Falwell in his his sermon, Ministers and Marches, and I finally tracked down a copy of that and, and read it for myself. And uh, I, I couldn't believe what he was saying like he was he was saying you know christians don't involve themselves in politics and a decade later he's he's at the head of a political charge and so i think that that kind of transformation leaves a lot of people thinking well yeah he transformed right after roe versus wade the timing fits uh the abortion narrative could you talk a little bit about the the timing of um Falwell's political conversion and and the religious right? <laughs> sure, I'm happy to do that. And I will point out something that uh, I think nobody else has observed or noticed, but um, so I'll take some credit for it unless somebody calls me off of this claim. But uh, I think that I'm the first historian to notice that that famous sermon you mentioned of ministers and marches, Jerry Falwell preached on a Sunday evening at Thomas Road Baptist Church on March 21st, 1965. And that was the day of the march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. So he was clearly directing his uh, fire against Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders for being involved in politics. And as you say, then a decade later, he utterly flips away from that. Uh, Falwell himself claims that what got him mobilized politically was the Roe v. Wade decision of January 22nd, 1973. However, he also concedes that he did not preach his first anti-abortion sermon until February 26th, 1978. That's more than five years after the Roe v. Wade decision. So that should, you know, cause people to scratch their heads a little bit and wondering if that's a real 
honest narrative on his part. And I'm not making any accusations because I don't know, um, I don't know a person's heart. And so I can't really say that, but I'm a historian and I do know, I can recognize facts when I see it. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the abortion issue, what I've come to call the abortion myth, I will point out that in 1968, this is before the Roe v. Wade decision, of course, 1968, Christianity Today, the flagship magazine of evangelicalism, together with another evangelical group called the Christian Medical Society, convened a conference to discuss the morality of abortion. And 23, three weight, 23 heavyweight theologians from the evangelical world gathered for several days, hashed out the issue. At the conclusion of that gathering, they issued a statement saying, we can't agree that abortion is a moral issue, but we think it should be available. Two successive editors of Christianity Today magazine concurred with that sentiment. 1971, meeting in St. Louis, Missouri, the messengers or the delegates, they call them messengers, but delegates to the Southern Baptist Convention, meeting in St. Louis, Missouri, if I didn't say that already, passed a resolution, resolution calling for the legalization of abortion. Now, the Southern Baptist Convention is not generally known as a redoubt of liberalism, but they reaffirmed that resolution in 1974, the year after Roe v. Wade, and again in 1976. When the Roe decision was handed down, evangelicals by and large were silent on the matter. The evangelical voices who did weigh in actually praised the Roe v. Wade decision, including W.A. Criswell, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, and a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. So uh, that is just, I mean, I'm, you know, there's more evidence, but, you know, that's, that's what I call the abortion myth. And the abortion myth is the fiction that evangelicals rallied or galvanized as a political entity in the 1970s in direct response to Roe v. Wade. And I'll ask, I'll add a personal anecdote to that as well. I spent the 1970s uh, really cocooned in what I call the evangelical subculture. That is to say, I was a freshman in college at Trinity College, Deerfield, Illinois in 1972. That's just before the Roe v. Wade decision. And then I graduated in 1976. And then after the, uh, the remaining years of the 1970s, I was a uh, actually an employee of Trinity Divinity School, as well as a, a master's student there. And you know, again, abortion simply wasn't part of the pot conversation. Uh, this was just not an issue that evangelicals cared about. They considered it a Catholic issue throughout the 1970s. Yeah, I, I uh, before we kind of get into that more evidence, because you've got you've got something that was priceless for me that I, I wasn't able to get somewhere else. Um, but before we get to that, I do want to uh, w when I uh, looked at of ministers and marches. So the copy that I got was I think it was a digital from Liberty's library. So I was kind of skeptical. I don't know if, if that was altered at all, um, but it, it, it looked it looked like it was it was legit, but it had the date. And yeah, the, the Selma thing is interesting. And it was, I believe it was also like four weeks to the day after Malcolm X was assassinated. So you've got all of these historical events that are going on at that time. And, and if you look in his, his sermon, he even mentions Alabama, like he, he specifically mentions it, which is, you know, where the march was going on. So yeah, I think, I think that's too coincidental for sure. Um, so the, the thing that that you gave me that um i think would be you know if we were in a court of law i think would be extremely important because you know like you said we can't know people's hearts and um we hearsay and all of these other things um don't make for great cases but in your book you talk a bit about uh, this this experience you had i think it was in 1990 or, or right around there yeah. um where, where you actually were able to talk face to face with, with some of the big individuals responsible for um, the, the Republican Party and, the, and the, the moral majority. So I would love for you to talk about that conversation, who you talked sure. with, why that sure. was important, what you said, and, and how that kind <laughs> of, because um, that's straight from the horse's mouth. And that, that to me is, uh, yeah. is powerful. 
Yeah, I didn't say much. I listened a lot. I said I didn't say very much at that occasion. Yeah, uh, what happened was that in November of 1990, I was invited. Uh, I was at that time uh, an assistant professor at uh, Columbia University, where I ended up teaching for 27 years. But I was invited to a gathering in Washington, D.C. in November 1990. And I actually, for years, I puzzled over why I was invited to this thing, because I just... I, it just didn't make sense to me. And I almost didn't go at the last minute. I had, you know, I had uh, a young family. I was, you know, busy teaching, trying to write books and so forth. And uh, I decided at the last minute, yes, I'm going to go. I went to this thing. So I found myself in Washington, D.C. in a hotel conference room with Richard Land of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, you know, religious right guy. Uh, Paul Weirich, the architect of the religious right. Um, I'm trying to remember his first name. I can't remember at this moment. Uh, uh, Ed Dobson, uh, who was at that time, or he was, he had just left, but he had been Jerry Falwell's lieutenant at uh, Moral Majority. Donald Wildman, head of the American Family Association, the guy who uh, was responsible for a lot of boycotts of television at that time. Um, uh, Carl F. H. Henry, the founding editor of Christianity Today magazine. Uh, Richard Vigory, the conservative direct mail guru. Ralph Reed, the director of the uh, Christian Coalition, uh, Pat Robertson's organization. So I find myself in this conference room thinking, I don't think I belong here. And it turned out, I, I don't think I realized it before I went, but it turned out that the whole of the conference was meant to mark the 10 year anniversary of Ronald Reagan's election to the presidency uh, in November, 1980, 10 years earlier. And so I thought, well, I, you know, I didn't celebrate 10 years earlier. I'm not sure I'm gonna celebrate now, but I'm here, I might as well make the best of this. And so I'm there and, and sitting in on these sessions and in the first session in, in the commentary, Paul Weirich made this impassioned speech. He said, let's remember that this movement, meaning the religious right, did not get organized in response to abortion or to the Roe v. Wade decision. Not at all, he said. Uh, let's be clear about this. We got going as a political movement to defend tax exemption in evangelical institutions, including Bob Jones University, which of course uh, was segregated. And, you know, again, he was emphatic about this. And so at the end of that session, in, the, in a break between the sessions, I went over to him and I said, I want to make sure I understood you correctly. Abortion had nothing to do with the genesis of this movement. He says, absolutely not. He said, I've been trying since the Goldwater campaign in 1964 to get these people, meaning evangelicals, interested in politics. He said, I tried everything. I tried the school prayer issue. I tried the pornography issue. I tried the abortion issue. I tried the women's rights issue. Nothing got their attention until the Internal Revenue Service started coming after places like Bob Jones University. That's what got the attention of people like Jerry Falwell, who, of course, has started his own segregation academy in Lynchburg in 1967. So anyway, that exchange uh, got me started on this sort of um, decades-long treasure hunt to chase down the real origins of the religious right. And I have to say that I don't agree with Paul Weirich about much of anything, but on that case, on that point, he was absolutely right. Abortion had nothing whatsoever to do with the genesis of the religious right. Yeah, that's so so powerful coming straight from their mouths. And, um, you know, I, I mean, not to say that I think that, that they would be, they would purposefully lie, but, I can't imagine somebody in that group admitting to that today, you know, knowing how powerful the the abortion was, was abortion, um, you know, the knowledge of one issue voting and all of that stuff. Was that just not uh, at the forefront at that point yet? Like, did they not realize how powerful it was? No, I think actually, I think what happened and I've tried to reconstruct this is I think there was a kind of a three part process for uh, evangelical uh, political engagement. The first was uh, a court ruling, and again, it wasn't Roe v. Wade. It was actually the court ruling was the district court for the district, district of Columbia in a case called Green v. Connolly. And on June 30th, 1971, the district court issued a, a ruling that said, in effect, any organization that engages in racial discrimination or racial segregation is not by definition 
a charitable institution. And therefore it has no claims on tax exempt status. So that was the catalyst because that was that prompted the Internal Revenue Service to start making inquiries about places like Bob Jones University, but also various whites only church sponsored segregation academies that had been formed to um, elude or evade desegregation in, in the public schools. So that was the, the first step. The second step, and again, this occurred later in the 1970s, and this I, I, um, I credit or I blame <laughs> Paul Weyrich, who uh, I sometimes call an evil genius. He, he really was quite savvy in terms of, of politics and, and political machinations. Uh, the second move was to say, oh, this is not a defense of racial segregation. This is not racism. This is the defense of, of religious freedom. Thereby writing a page from the modern religious right playbook you know, that you see in the Hobby Lobby case, for example, or in the California cake maker case. This is not a matter of defending racial segregation. We're defending religious freedom. It was a brilliant move. What he failed to mention is that tax exemption is a form of public subsidy, right? I, 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 there's no debating that. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use a personal example. I, uh, I'm, a, in addition to being a professor, I'm a, an Episcopal priest. And I, one of my parishes, actually my first parish, was in northwestern Connecticut in a rather affluent little town in northwest Connecticut called Washington. And we, of course, paid no property taxes in that very affluent community. Uh, because we were a church, a tax-exempt organization. Well, that meant that the taxpayers in that town, not that they couldn't afford it, by the way, they could <laughs> they could well afford it, but they had to pay extra for fire protection, for police services, for maintenance of the public parks, and so forth. So tax exemption is a form of public subsidy. So when Paul Weyrick and then Jerry Falwell began crying about uh, this is an assault on religious freedom. They fail to acknowledge that tax exemption is public subsidy. So that was the second move. The third move brings us to the abortion question. Weirich was savvy enough to recognize that he couldn't effectively build a grassroot, grassroots movement of white evangelicals simply by defending racial segregation. Uh, even in the late 1970s, that wasn't going to fly. And so he was looking about for another issue. And what happens is that in the midterm elections of 1978, he stumbles on the abortion issue. And here's what happened. Weirich, again, by his own account, in advance of the 1978 election, went to the head of the Republican National Committee. At that time, it was uh, Bill Brock of Tennessee, former senator from Tennessee. And he asked for money to try to organize these evangelical voters. And according to Weirich, Brock looked across the desk at, at Weirich and said, who are you? I, who are these people? Are you crazy? I'm not gonna give you any money for this. And so Weirich, again, by his own account, resolved to go out and elect some rather improbable people to uh, during the midterm elections of 1978. And he focused on four Senate races, uh, New Hampshire, Iowa, and Minnesota. There were two Senate races. One of them was for the unexpired term of Walter Mondale, who of course was Jimmy Carter's vice president. And in all four of those races, the final weekend of that campaign, pro-lifers, Roman Catholics, because at that time, um, abortion was a Catholic issue, um, almost exclusively. Pro-lifers leafleted church parking lots and an election with a very low turnout two days later, all four of the favored Democratic candidates lost to anti-abortion Republicans. I remember very clearly running, uh, reading through Paul Weirich's archives, which are actually out at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, and looking at his correspondence surrounding that midterm election of 1978, and I, I've said this often, it's almost like the, the papers began to sizzle 
because he realized he finally had found an issue that was going to galvanize grassroots evangelicals. Opposition to abortion was going to work for him as a political issue. Even so, even so, and you were talking then about the midterm election of 1978, so November of 1978. Frank Schaefer has told me, in, 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 again, very emphatically, that when he and his father and C. Everett Koop began touring the country in the first three months of 1979 with their film series, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, this anti-abortion film series, he said that the crowds were very, very meager. And the response on the part of evangelicals in early 1979 on the abortion issue was quite tepid. Uh, another bit of evidence. In, uh, or on August 22nd, 1980, Ronald Reagan, the Republican nominee, addressed a group of anywhere from 10 to 20,000 evangelicals, the, the numbers, the uh, estimates of the crowd vary in Dallas, Texas at Reunion Arena. Uh, this is the event where he famously said to this group, I know this group can't, can't endorse me, but I want you to know that I endorse you and what you're doing, brought down the house and arguably sealed the evangelical vote for the 1980 presidential election. I read through his um, speech on that occasion out at the uh, Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California. And on that occasion, he talked about creationism. He decried Jimmy Carter's unconstitutional agenda against evangelical schools, meaning places like Bob Jones University. He did not mention abortion even once in that address before 10 to 20,000 screaming evangelicals in August of 1980. So even as late as August 1980, the Reagan-Bush campaign was not persuaded that abortion was going to work for them as a political issue in November. All right. Yeah, I uh, I particularly liked um, how how you pulled out some of the the language. You know, this focus on on religious liberty. I grew up, like I told you, at a Christian school, and I thought for the longest time, and probably until I was in high school, that literally uh, in a public school you couldn't pray or read the Bible. That that was my understanding of of uh, you know right. secular public schools, and I, I think religious liberty is used a lot. And and uh, but as soon as a Satanist wants to do something uh, or or a Muslim, you know, then there's no such thing as religious liberty. It's duplicitous. Can I, can I uh, interject on this? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the 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 book I'm working right now on right now is. Um, biography of Mark Hatfield, a Republican senator from Oregon, uh, evangelical Christian, a Baptist. And um, he's, he's, a, he's a real Baptist, by which I mean he understands the First Amendment and the separation of church and state, which is founded on a bedrock Baptist principle. You don't mess with the, the line of separation between church and state. Um, and I just found this in the congressional record, this is from back in uh, 1994, July 27th, 1994. And he, uh, Mr. Hatfield, uh, Senator Hatfield, went to the floor of the Senate to address the whole issue of trying to legislate public prayer in public schools. Uh, and he said, I'm gonna read just a, a snippet here. We are dealing with, of course, a very personal issue in matter of prayer. We're dealing with the issue of protecting religious religion and religious convictions. I must say very frankly that I oppose all prescriptive prayer of any kind in public schools, as any true Baptist should. By the way, does that mean I'm against prayer? No, it does not mean that at all. I am very strong in my belief in the efficacy of prayer, but I must say that there is no way this body, meaning the Senate, or the Constitution, or the President, or the courts, should ever abolish prayer in public schools. That is impossibility. I often use somewhat facetiously the example and experience of having prayed my way through every math course examination I ever took. I was not praying to the teacher. I was not praying to my fellow students. I was engaging in silent prayer to God. 
who thought I was more powerful than I, who I thought was more powerful than I, and that all students and all the students put, put together. Uh, all I'm saying is that this can be very personal and silent prayer is happen, happening all the time. Uh, so, you know, that uh, addresses your, uh, your issue. Uh, you certainly can pray in public schools. The issue is prescribed prayer in public schools, which is a clear violation of the First Amendment. Sorry to take you down that. Uh, no, no, no. That was that was good. And I, I mean, again, I, I think that shows how uh, information is is wielded. And you know, I, I wouldn't say that I think my teachers were were maliciously lying to us. There's just th this this narrative that kind of gets started somehow. And uh, and it it goes on. Um, so here here's a, a big question for you because so I, I don't think that abortion is a a good moral choice to make. I think that um, I agree. I think that it's terrible the situation that people are put in. I empathize with a lot of people who have abortions. I understand that there's so many so many causes that that underline uh, underlie abortions um so what would you say to somebody who says okay even even if i take your narrative about um you know all this evidence that you give us about how abortion wasn't it, it wasn't brought up because people really cared about that uh, it was kind of used people were kind of manipulated nevertheless it's true that abortion is killing a, a valuable human being made in the image of God. And we've arrived at that truth. So at this point, like we're still one issue voters, despite our history, what would you say to somebody like that? Why does it matter how we got here? Well, I, first, I think it matters. I think racism matters. And so, and I'm happy to, to address that a little bit later in my uh, in, in, in our conversation. Um, but first of all, I agree that uh, that uh, abortion is a moral abomination, um, uh, except for you know, the obvious exceptions, uh, rape, incest, uh, the life and well-being of the mo mother and, and that sort of thing. But I think that's precisely the point as I what I would argue. Now I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of setting aside my historian's hat for the moment and talking about as, my understanding of the, of the issue and how it should be addressed as a as a believer, as a Christian, um, and I think you put your your language was precisely right. Uh, I regard abortion as a moral issue, not a legal issue. What I find striking about the abortion debate, or what passes for the abortion debate these days, which I think is a pretty anemic debate, frankly, but that's another that's another matter. But what I find striking is that the only thing that both sides of the abortion debate agree on is that making abortion illegal is not going to make it materially less frequent. So what does that tell us? It tells us that if you're truly interested in limiting the incidence of abortion, the law, the courts, is not going to be the way to do it. Women are still going to have abortions. I mean, let's not let's not kid ourselves about this. If you truly want to limit the incidence of abortion, of abortion, we have to change the moral conversation. That is to change the moral debate. And I'm willing to go to great lengths to do that, including public service billboards discouraging people from having abortion. But let's make clear that we also need to be clear that we also have to couple that with the availability of contraceptions, sex education, and measures like that. If we're truly sincere about limiting the incidence of abortion, I think we have several things we have to do. And again, I think it is a moral issue. It's not a legal issue. I mean, you know, just to put it in kind of simple terms. When does the state issue a birth certificate, right? At birth, not at conception. You know, uh, this is just, it's, and this is, and, and even within Christian theology, the, the traditional point of no return in terms of the fetus 
is the moment of quickening, which is several weeks at least into a pregnancy before uh, the quickening is when you when you feel or can discern the the, the fetus moving uh, on his or her own. Uh, I, I again, I think it's a moral issue. It's not a legal issue. So then, how would you differentiate that between? You know, somebody says murder is murder if they're if they're created if a fetus is created in the image of God, um, and they're killed, and uh, you know a toddler or an adult yep. is created. Why is that a legal issue as opposed to a, just a moral issue? Uh, again, I think it's because you have to understand when, at what point does the state take an interest in the individual. Uh, again, it's not at conception. Now, now, I know that there are some of the anti-abortion people who are trying to kind of roll that back and say that the state has a, a vested interest in the individual at the moment of conception. Uh, but, you know, I, I, that's a, I think that's a heavy lift <laughs> uh, legally uh, to make that case. It, I, uh, I saw a cartoon uh, the other day uh, saying, you know, um, uh, showing a pregnant woman being uh, pulled over by a police officer and protesting, well, officer, according to the laws of the state of blank, whatever it is, Arkansas, whatever, um, my fetus is uh, is a person and therefore I should be allowed to drive in the HOV lane. <laughs> you know, you get into things like that and it, it, you know, it kind of, it kind of uh, descends pretty quickly into absurdity. Yeah, so so you would say that um, you know trying to make abortion illegal is om- it's almost showing that uh, Christians are sort of reaching for a theonomy of sorts, like they're they're trying to, and probably the same thing with with uh, gay marriage and other sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I suppose. I, uh, okay. Yeah, I guess I have to think about that a little bit longer, but uh, yeah, it's it's just it just doesn't. I mean, it it, it defies common sense, but it also defies, I think. It defies, you know, centuries of understanding of, uh, of gestation, um, but also, you know, what are the limits of the law? I, you know, I, I, uh, you know, and I, I want to make it clear in this conversation that I honor those who are sincerely, you know, um, um, opposed to abortion in any and all cases or whatever, whatever their position might be. I and I, I have a great deal of sympathy for it, but again, I think. It should be addressed as a moral issue rather than a legal issue. Okay. Um, last question that I want. I, just a minute. I, okay. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Th- this is my last question, and if um, hopefully it dovetails into. I know you wanted to to talk about race here, um, and I think yeah. it'll it'll dovetail into that a little bit. But uh, if it doesn't, you can you can kind of make it make it work and uh, get that in. But, um, you know, as, as part of studying propaganda over the past six months or so, um, I, I ended up reading Mein Kampf just a little bit ago. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was really struck by, by one point that Hitler made. I mean, he, he makes a lot of brilliant points, unfortunately, for propaganda and, and how sure. it's used. One of the things that he said is that, um, you know, he's giving this example of if there is, uh, you know, there's you're one person, but there are four different people who have, uh, who are against you. They're opposed to you. And he says that can actually make you look really weak because you've got four opponents. He said, the trick is you have to lump all of those opponents into one opponent, you know, find, find some common thread so that you can, you can put them in one category. And Jacques Ellul in, in his, uh, you know, his work on propaganda, he, he says basically the same thing where he talks about polarization or, um, you know, this Manichaean view, this all black, all white, and this, this yeah. polarization. Yeah. Um, because if, yeah. if you only have to deal with one idea, then y- you can just dismiss sure. all of the other ideas that, that would probably argue you down. So right. w- with, with the evangelical community today, you know, the word liberal or Marxist or woke, you know, there's, those are, are three easy ways to dismiss anything, right? Uh, sure. I, I don't like that information. Uh, that that's woke information. Um, so you see this with with systemic racism, with CRT, with all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think I think a lot of evangelicals would be surprised because because I was for sure that uh, 
over the last 150 years, um, the evangelicals have been engaged in quite a lot of social social justice issues or woke issues, whatever you want to call them. I'd love sure. if you could give us a, a little bit of a background of uh, the transformation of evangelicalism in, in terms of social justice, and then maybe dovetail that into to some comments that you might want to make on on race in regard to abortion oh, and sure, propaganda. Yeah. Happy to do that. And, you know, again, as a historian and, and somebody who grew up as evangelical, um, one of the things that I started to learn in, in, in college was that evangelicals have a very long and I would say quite distinguished um, history of social concern, uh, particularly in the 19th century coming out of the Second Great Awakening. And that concern was directed particularly to those on the margins of society, those called, Jesus called the least of these. So if you look at evangelical uh, political and social activism in the 19th century, you find they were involved in various peace crusades. They were involved in prison reform. Uh, they were leaders in the common school movement, what we call public schools today or public education, uh, because they recognized that was the way for those on the lower rungs of society to become upwardly mobile and become uh, to join the middle class. They were, uh, they were engaged in uh, the women's rights movement, women's equality. I mean, you know, the, the opposition to the ERA is just one of the great travesties of my lifetime, in my judgment, particularly because evangelicals uh, lined up against equal rights for women, which is just an utter betrayal of their own heritage, their own history. Yeah, and, and that's uh, still not passed, right? I mean, it's still well, no. It hasn't been it hasn't been ratified. No, yeah. no, no, because of Phyllis Schlafly and these other people. Uh, uh, so, and 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 the other thing that that, that I re learned more recently about evangelical activism in the nineteenth century is that uh, people like Charles Grandison Finney, who by any measure is the most influential evangelical in the nineteenth century, uh, were adamantly opposed to free market capitalism because capitalism elevates avarice over altruism and therefore is not Christian. Um, um, Charles Finney said that a Christian businessman was an oxymoron and we didn't use that language, but that's what he was arguing. right So you I, I, you look or I, I look at that history as, as somebody who's who, who grew up as an evangelical and still wants to claim that, that mantle. And I look back and I say, wow, this is really quite a remarkable history. What happened? Well, you know, again, we probably don't have time. I know we don't have time to get into all the, the steps along the way, but uh, that uh, general focus uh, really persisted until at least the early decades of the uh, 20th century. Um, then what happens is the evangelicals kind of go underground. And this is when they start building their subculture as a, as a, uh, a place of refuge, as, as a separate entity from the larger culture. But they begin to go back into the, uh, the larger world in the 1970s. And again, if you're looking for a milepost um, on this, uh, you can do a whole lot worse than looking at the 1973 Chicago Declaration of Evangelical Social Concern, which is a remarkable document that seeks to uh, 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 resurrect a lot of the social emphases of 19th century evangelicals. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I urge you and anybody else to, to look at that document, the 1973 version of the Chicago Declaration of Evangelical Social Concern, which really is a quite a remarkable document. Um, then we go through the 1970s. Uh, Jeremy Card, of course, uh, an evangelical Christian, Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher, runs for uh, president in 1976. Uh, he captures roughly half of the evangelical vote. And I think many evangelicals were voting for, for Carter, um, lot, many of them at least, uh, just out of the novelty of being able to vote for one of their own <laughs> for president. And then you have the rise of the religious right, which occurs late in the 1970s in advance of the 1980 presidential election. And that's when uh, you get back into this whole narrative about racism and the rise of the uh, religious right. And I think the larger importance of racism here, uh, and it didn't become clear to me until I was writing um, 
Bad Faith, the, the book came out just last August. Um, and I was trying to make sense of how evangelicals got from their origins in the 1970s to 81%, 81% of, of white evangelicals. I still a staggering number to me. Um, supporting Donald Trump for president in 19, I'm sorry, in 2016. Now, this is the man who really can't be associated with family values very readily. I mean, I think that's probably the understatement of, of, uh, of the century so far. Um, and yet 81% of white evangelicals vote for Donald Trump. And I began to kind of retrace my steps historically, going back to um, the origins of the religious right in the defense of segregation. And uh, it became clear to me that the key intermediate figure in that is Ronald Reagan himself, the man that many evangelicals look to as a political messiah, and uh, or a demigod for that matter. And um, looking at Reagan's career, Reagan started politics in California in opposition to the Rumford Fair Housing Act, which sought to guarantee equal access to housing. He was a uh, outspoken opponent of both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Throughout his political campaigns, he frequently invoked the racially charged phrase, law and order. And uh, anybody who lived through that era can hardly forget his vile caricature of so-called welfare queens, women of color, who supposedly were living off the public dole in lives of luxury. He was never able to produce any of these welfare queens, but he was, he was sure they existed. Uh, you add to that the fact that as president, he uh, persisted in his support of the apartheid South African government, and he decimated the Civil Rights Commission as president. And for me, the most... Um, damning event occurred on August 3rd, 1980, when Ronald Reagan opened his general election campaign for the presidency after winning the Republican nomination. August 3rd, 1980, in of all places, the Neshoba County Fair in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the place where 16 summers earlier, Members of the Ku Klux Klan, in collusion with the local sheriff's department, abducted, tortured, and murdered three civil rights workers during Freedom Summer. Reagan was the master of symbolism, but in case anybody missed his intent on that occasion, he invoked the decades-old segregationist battle cry, I believe in states' rights. So trying to understand the religious right. You have to understand its roots in a defense of racial segregation and where it ended up in 2016 and 2020 and in the race of Donald Trump, you know, not exactly the family values guy. You have to also understand Ronald Reagan. You have to loop him to, into the narrative as well. So, uh, you know, I, I repeat that I honor people who are dedicated to the anti-abortion cause. I, uh, I have a great deal of sympathy for them. But I also think it's important to acknowledge racism. And in my understanding as a historian, uh, unacknowledged, unrepented racism tends to fester. And I think that's what we see in 2016 and again in 2020, and now again, even continuing. Uh, because evangelicals have failed to account for the racism at the roots of their political movement. Yeah, and uh, I think what's unfortunate is, I think through through the civil rights era, uh, I think evangelicals were sort of starting to account for it. I mean, the the the, the point that they couldn't get um, you know a base around segregation. Um, shows that, uh, okay, well, you know, people have that in their consciences. 
But I think uh, the reason I wanted to end with Hitler's quote here or Hitler's idea here is because I think it's brilliant what happened. It's un- it's terrible, but it's brilliant in that they got their racism um, by by lumping lumping it into this one common enemy, and now we have um, one issue voters that uh, only see one enemy and one good, and and you defend your group, and it's uh, right. it's all black and white. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I would love, you know, I, I've spent arguably much of my career trying to call evangelicals back to their better selves and say, listen, you, uh, first of all, you have the Bible, you have the New Testament, you have the example of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. And he's pretty clear about um, what what he, he expects uh, of his followers. Um, you know, he, he, he talks about he talks about welcoming the stranger, for example. That certainly has some implication for immigration, I should think. Now, you know, I understand that borders are are, are touchy issues and they're difficult issues. But when Jesus tells us to welcome the stranger, it seems to me that has some relevance to immigration policy. Uh, Jesus takes tells us to take care of the widows and the or- orphans, to visit the prisoners and and to uh, to to feed those who are are hungry that has certain implications or ramifications for social policy it seems to me so i've been trying to you know to to emphasize that but also to point out um, the uh, what i consider the noble legacy of 19th century evangelical activism on social matters and that i think points you in a very different direction from that of the religious right well, thank you very much. Um, and that's that's all that I have for you in terms of questions. If there's anything that uh, that you think would be good to say at this point, or anything that you think uh, I've overlooked <laughs> in regard to to propaganda or anything, I, uh, I'd love to hear it. No, I uh, I know you've been very thorough. I, I think I, I think one of the things that fuels this movement that is the religious right is uh, the rhetoric of victimization. And so you mentioned Hitler earlier, and I'm not trying to draw direct parallels between Hitler and the leaders of the religious right. Please understand that. I'm not, I'm not doing that. But what the leaders of the religious right have been so good at doing is painting themselves and by extension, all evangelicals as victims in the culture in some way or another. And I, I think I, you know, there you know, arguably some basis for that, but I think it's it, it's it's grossly exaggerated if if there is. And uh, I, I think, frankly, that's one of the reasons they gravitated to Donald Trump in 2016 is because uh, nobody speaks the language of victimization more fluently than Donald Trump. Uh, now it's always about him; he's always the victim, of course, but. I think evangelicals rec- uh, recognized that and it resonated with them in, in some way. But I think as you pointed out earlier, there's real danger in that. There's real danger in that sort of uh, rhetoric. Man, we're, we're seeing it playing out right now. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. And again, I appreciate you being willing to take time out of your day to do this. Uh, I appreciate it, Derek. I wish you all the best. God bless. Thanks. That's all for now. So peace, and because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.